Good morning, church. Today I want to share with you God's word from the book of Colossians. Three weeks ago, Pastor Dave started a series called Jesus, Uniquely Yours, where he's been conveying the Apostle Paul's message to the Colossian church to regard Jesus as superior to the spiritual powers and authorities of this world, as the only sufficient Savior from sin, and as the only sanctifier of his people. Meaning that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and working in you, giving us new life as we seek to submit to his authority and obey his word through his spirit. It is the message that Jesus, his love, his power, his authority, all of who he is, is uniquely yours. The passage that I've been tasked with is chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And in this chapter, Paul goes in detail about how the Christian, now having fully realized the power of the Spirit that has raised us up with Christ in his resurrection, now how that Christian is to live in light of that truth. We know that the life that the Christian lives is often characterized by the word sanctification, the process by which we are being made holy being made more like Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's just that. It's a process. It's a journey. It's not something that happens all up in a moment. Contrary to popular belief, Christians are not perfect people. A famous evangelist once said that it is only the Christian that can say with certainty that they are going to heaven without being self-righteous. Because the true Christian is not going to heaven because they are somehow fundamentally good or have done some good, but because they recognize that they are not fundamentally good. They recognize that their work and good deeds are not sufficient for reconciling with God and spending eternity with him. They recognize that the human condition is to prefer that our own way uh, is better than God's way, and thus crowning ourselves the gods of our own little reality. It is the true Christian, however, who has come face to face with the truth of the gospel and has said, I am not able to make myself right before God. But thanks be to God, for in his great mercy, he has sent Jesus to live the perfect life that we could not live, that we could never live, to die as the penalty that we have earned through our rebellion and have been raised to life with Christ in power that all who trust in the work of Christ might have his righteousness credited to the sinner's account and may live by that same power. And so the truth of Christianity actually compels us to confess that we are indeed not perfect. Now the work that Jesus has done in crediting his position and his righteousness to our account is called justification, meaning that we've been made legally right before God. That means that we have Jesus' standing before God and are now able to enter into reconciliation with our Heavenly Father. Yet this does not mean that the Christian is now perfect. Now that they have been made right before God, the Spirit now lives within the believer and does the work of sanctification, working in us to actively conform us to the image of Christ and draw us to love God more deeply. It is a lifelong process of battling with the parts of us that are worldly and making them submit to the rule and reign of Christ. And so Paul's letter to the Colossian church outlines how exactly a Christian is to grow more and more to love, honor, and follow Christ. Paul reveals the end result of being transformed and renewed by the Holy Spirit in verse 17. He says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In sum, it is a life devoted to bringing fame and glory to God through all that we do. And so now, let's read together Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. If then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death whatever is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, in uh, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, the first thing I want to, you to notice is in the first two words, the words, if, then. Here's, here's a pro tip for biblical interpretation. We try to interpret the word and the truth of any given verse, not in isolation, but based on the context in which it was written. In the case of words like therefore or if then, what follows is written in response to what preceded it. And so what was Paul talking about before his encouragement to set our minds on the things above? Well, in the previous chapter, Paul was confronting a dangerous heresy that had started to infiltrate the church. Now, at the time, there were two major false teachings circulating the church. The first was that of the Judaizers, or the circumcision, who taught that salvation was through Jesus, plus obedience to the oral tradition and the Jewish cultural laws. The second heresy was a sort of proto-Gnosticism, which taught that salvation was through Jesus, plus secret knowledge learned through encounters with false angels and spiritual forces, and through asceticism, which is just physical harm done to the body. So what was circulating in the church in Colossae was actually a sort of synthesis between these two heresies. And Paul addresses it actually in chapter 2, verses 16 and 18, which says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. So Paul addresses each belief directly, Summing it up in the statement in verse 23, in chapter 2, these have indeed the appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. So Paul is taking a stand right here. These practices are in no way beneficial to you on your path to sanctification. They will not make you more like Christ, and they will not draw you closer to Christ. He calls these practices earthly solutions from which you have been set free from since you have participated in the death of Christ. 
And he says in verse 15 in chapter 2 that he proclaims that Christ has been victorious over these powers, these uh, spiritual forces, uh, through his finished work on the cross. And so you also are not bound to them. Now, having read this, I can see right away some modern equivalents to some of these first century false teachings. In this day and age that we live in currently, we hear so many voices telling us about the true secret to knowledge of God and knowledge of self that will liberate us and set us free from an, or, or rather set us free to live a life of a, spiritu a spirituality. We, t we hear talk about meditating by emptying our minds and turning off our minds. We see every self-help self -help book and their five steps to achieving a satisfying and purposeful life. We even see a new age paganism infiltrating some churches with the power of positive thinking or positive confession, speaking your prosperity into existence. There's nothing new about these teachings. The enemy has always sought to pervert God's word and keep his people and their eyes off of the true and clear path that scripture has shown us. Just as Paul says in verse 23, they may seem like good ideas, but they only have the appearance of wisdom. He even goes on uh, to call them man-made traditions and empty deceit. Why? Because Jesus, as it says in chapter 1 verse 20, is the universe's creator and sustainer. That means the world and all that is within it was made by and was made for Christ's glory and good pleasure. He is before all things. He is the head, the ruler, and the authority over all the affairs of man. And he has spoken to his people the verbally inspired word that the Holy Spirit gave to write down and has given as uh, 2 Peter 1.3 says, he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us to his own glory and excellence. And so now we see the reason for Paul's dramatic emphasis here in Colossians chapter 3. If we have been raised with Christ, we do not need to look to what man has said or man has created and devised that will somehow lead us to God and, and godliness or satisfying and purposeful existence, because these things are earthly. As far as Paul is concerned, so we then must set our eyes and our minds higher than on earth, but on Christ and the things that are higher. And so Paul continues his treatise on growing in sanctification, becoming more like Christ. He sets before us two lists. The first a list of behaviors and practices and dispositions of the heart that belong to the old self, the man or the woman who has been ruled by sin and has lived according to their own conceptions of what is right and what's wrong. These things we must put away. He says we must put them to death. In verse 9, it says that we are to put off the old self, much like a put, taking off a garment or a coat. These things are a marker. They were the uniform from when we played for our own team. Read with me what it says in verses 5 and 9, 5 through 9. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And now we see conversely, the second list Paul presents to the church is a list of behaviors and practices and dispositions of the heart that belong now to the new self. The, uh, rather, those who are submitting their will and actions to God through obedience to the Spirit and to the Word and through denial of our sinful nature. He says in verse 12 and 14, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, 
bearing with one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so these things are now the markers of those who have been made new in Christ. These are the uniforms for those who are now playing for God's team. It is so important, again, to note that this process of sanctification, of putting off the old self, is an ongoing journey. Although we have been made legally right before God, we still battle with this body of flesh that we reside in and its earthly desires until Jesus returns again to restore creation to glory, eradicating the effects of sin permanently. We battle to submit our will our, 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 our acts and our desires to the Holy Spirit. His perfect life, Jesus' perfect life and work on the cross was the inauguration of his kingdom's rule and reign here on earth, again, through justifying us before God. And his second coming will be the completion, the consummation of his kingdom's rule in us, the glorification of our physical bodies. And so our sanctification process is that battle of uh, is that battle uh, uh, with our desires of the flesh and submitting ourselves to the rule of Christ in all that we say and in all that we do. And the Holy Spirit's role in dwelling within us is that it convicts us and convinces us of the truth of, of sin and righteousness, as it says in John 16. And Romans 6 says that the indwelling spirit in every believer bears witness and testifies to the truth that they are children of God and calls them to walk in light of that truth. That they are that they belong to God and no longer have to live life their own way, but are called according to God's better way, the life that He has designed for us to live. Now, perhaps we could say that both Paul and those purporting the false teacher, false teaching. Uh, addressed in uh, uh, chapter 2, we could perhaps say that they maybe agree that sexual immorality, anger, and wrath are, are evil things and that they should be put to death. And again, maybe we could say that, uh, that they may agree on the fact that the, the community of God should foster attributes like humility, love, and patience. But the question at hand is not about whether these things are evil or that these things are right, but it, it is in regard to the method with which we deal with these things. The, Juda the Judaizers believed that it was about adhering to religious festivals or food laws, while the Gnostics believed it was about starving oneself and beating your body and being caught up in visions and trances with dark spiritual entities. Those things would make you holy. But that's not the case. What Paul says is that these things hold absolutely no value in killing the evil and selfish desires of our hearts because they themselves are earthly solutions to deeper spiritual problems. Our minds are too fixated on what can be done here on this earthly plane. But God, through Paul, is encouraging and urging the church to set their minds on something higher. Life and godliness begins when we engage our minds with Christ and the higher things of God. Remember, sanctification is far from just behavior modification, being good. But it is the radical transformation of the heart and its desires for God and for a sovereign will and plan to do things God's way and not our own way. But now we have to ask, how do we set our minds on the things above? Well, if you look with me in the text, you'll see that the key on um, setting our minds right with Christ can be found in verse 10, which says this. Uh, um, and you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so Paul is saying that the setting of our mind upon Christ comes from being renewed in knowledge of our creator God. If we know more deeply the one whom we worship, would it not logically follow that we begin to see how then we should live or how he calls us to live? Now, to many of you, this may seem like a no-brainer, but just follow with me for a minute. 
How many people do we know that make claims about who God is or about how God would deal in any given situation based not on what they know to be true about God from his word, but based rather on things that, uh, rather based, um, based on things on how they feel should be true about God? How many people do you know that have based their entire theology or conception on who God is, not based again on the verbally inspired word of God that God has given for us so that we may know him, but rather on some spiritual experience. Now, let me be clear. I am in no way saying that we shouldn't be having incredible spiritual experiences with God. His word is so clear on that. He, he tells us to taste and to see that the Lord is good. He is an experiential God who calls us to experience him. However, one of the major issues, issues in the church today is that we often do not test the spirits. We do not test our experiences against scripture to see if they truly are from God. We do not test the words that we are being preached, that are being preached to us, again, against the scriptures, even though we see all throughout scripture that those who use God's word as the standard and foundation of all knowledge are commended. We think about the Koreans in Acts 17. Or worse, we simply do not care about how God should be worshipped or obeyed and simply would rather focus on what we think our worship should be comprised of. How can that kind of relationship with God bring about any kind of godliness or acceptable worship? God has already revealed in his word how our lives should be an acceptable offering to him. Now, could you imagine if we approached our relationships or any of our, any of our other relationships, our marriages, in this manner? If we approached our workplace relationship with our employer this way? Now, I know my wife is an individual with whom I have an obligation to love her and to relate to her in a way that is unique to her. She's an individual. If I choose to interact with her in a way that is foreign to her, or is not uniquely tailored to who she is as a person, do my actions show that I truly love her or that I am simply too lazy to get to know her to see that she is a person with whom I am to contend with and interact with according to who she is, who I am, and what our relationship is. And the same is true for God. If I do not base my life and my worship my interactions with him in accordance with what his word says about who he is, does that, not, does that show that I truly love him or that I rather love a God made after my own fashioning? Throughout scripture, we see this, this word pop up. We see the, the, both the Greek and the Hebrew word for the verb to know paralleling this intimate relationship actually between a husband and a wife. It's quite beautiful. Jesus says that, Eternal life in, is uh, to know God the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And that same word know is actually uh, used in the Gospels in Luke when the Virgin, the Virgin Mary says, How can I be pregnant since I have never known a man? Thus, all of Scripture declares that true knowledge is like an intimate relationship. It engages with the object of our intimacy on every level and in every area of our lives. And so that is what Paul calls the church in chapter 1, verse 9. That is exactly why he calls them to grow in knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. Because when we are well acquainted with knowledge of God's attributes, his characteristics, his actions, his nature, we grow in wisdom, which is the application of our knowledge of God, which helps us to discern how to respond to all that life throws at us in a way that honors and brings glory to God. This is why the Apostle Paul abominates and despises these false teachings from chapter 2. Yes, they have the appearance of wisdom, but they are really self-adulating, pseudo-spiritual, man-made religion that have no place in our walk with Christ. Instead, let us set our minds on Christ, the attributes of God, that we may fall more deeply in love and reverence 
for our precious and worthy God who did not spare his own son for our salvation. So now we ask ourselves, how exactly do we engage our minds with the things of God in a meaningful way? Well, Paul lays out the blueprint here in verse 16. I love it. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And I want you to look carefully at this first part of the verse. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, in response to this command, I want to ask you uh, these questions. And I want you to ask yourselves uh, these two questions. Does God's word dwell in you? And does it dwell in you richly? The word that Paul uses in verse 16 when he says dwell, it really means to make yourself at home. And so when we think about our relationship with God's word, do we think about his word as an old friend? Do we think about it as a new acquaintance, a new friend, or as a constant companion? Is the word of God at home in you, or is it an infrequent guest, or worse, a complete stranger? And now, this is not a question designed to make you feel guilty. However, I ask it sincerely as one who has to had who uh, had to preach this message over and over and over again to my own heart. Have I truly been regenerated? Has my heart truly been made new to desire intimate knowledge of God and communion with him? And if not, do I at least have the desire to desire to know him? Now, to those of you who have no desire in your heart to know God, I want to urge you, I want to urge you, seek to know the person of Jesus in the gospel. Read it. Read the truth about who God is, what he has done for you in his mercy. And pray that the Spirit would convince you of this, that you would know humanity's wayward rebellion against God. Yet, may you also know that you are dearly loved by the one who created the universe and sustains it, continues to sustain it by the power of his might. May you be confounded by the reality that the holder of the cosmos wants you to be in relationship with him, that you may see his glory, follow him, obey him, worship him, and be satisfied and full of joy in him. Now, to those of you and those of us who perhaps are well acquainted with God's word, my question to you is this. Is the word of Christ dwelling in you richly? Now, richly simply means in abundance or lots of it, but not just in quantity, but also in quality. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. We should be clear, meditating in the biblical sense is not about emptying your mind or clearing your thoughts. That understanding of meditation finds its root in Eastern religions and New Age paganism. Meditation in, uh, in a scriptural sense is about finding, or rather filling your mind with the truth and the words of God so that they may permeate and percolate all throughout all the areas of your life. Now, Christian author and speaker John Ortberg uses a very unique image that I love uh, when describing what meditation means from a biblical standpoint. He calls it reverse worrying. So, but what does this mean? Think about it like this. When you worry about something, what naturally happens in your mind? If you suffer from anxiety or perhaps know someone who does, you know that your mind will take the small seed of insecurity or uncertainty and it will misappropriate it to every other area of your life. Say, if you're at the store and your debit gets declined, you begin to wonder the deeper things. You're going, oh my goodness, how am I going to pay for next week's groceries? How am I going to pay for my kids' tuition? Uh, am I ever going to save enough to actually see retirement? You see what I mean? Worry takes the insecurity and it metastasizes it across your entire world. Now, here's where I uh, think the idea of reverse worrying is actually a good understanding of meditation. You take 
the truth of what God has said in scripture, either about himself or about how we ought to live. And let it infuse in our minds as we apply it to all the other areas of our life. We think, think about this. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Beautiful song. All right. But what does it mean? What does it mean that God is my shepherd? Well, we know that the shepherd is a protector of the flock. But in light of the next statement, I shall not want, it paints him as a provider and as a comforter. And so we ask ourselves, again, in this reverse worrying, in what areas of my life do I need to preach this truth about God's character to? In what areas of my life do I need to trust God and walk in faith and belief and knowledge that he is my shepherd, Could it be my finances, my children, my job, my relationship, my future, all of these, all of these things coming under submission to the truth of God's character and nature. That he is my good shepherd. And in this process of meditating on God's word, the spirit does this amazing work of bringing about wisdom and discernment this application of the knowledge of God and, and, and percolating it and permeating it into every situation in our lives that we may honor and obey and imitate Christ in everything. Or as it says in verse 17, whatever we do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Spirit, again, illuminates the word that we read and brings about clarity that results in faith as we meditate on. And so you see, church, this is why meditation, again, the quality of our interaction with God's word, is vital in killing sin and walking in righteousness. God's word is living and active, and through it we grow in faith. For Paul says in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. Now, to, to quote the theologian and a hip-hop artist, Shai Lin, in his song, Cosmic Powers, he says this, the devil's top priority is that we deny the book. He will keep us from reading it. And if you're reading it, he will keep you from believing it. And if you're believing it, he will keep you from obedience. So these are the stages that we need to ask ourselves this morning, church. Are we reading it? And if we're reading it, are we believing it? And if we're believing it, are we being obedient to it? Remember, faith comes by hearing, and that hearing through the word of God. Therefore, it is evident that we have to cling to this, uh, this word, God's word, so tightly, as it is the only way through which we can have any union with God. Now, as I bring this message to a close, I want to offer to you some encouragement. Because oftentimes when we are convicted with the truth of God's word, from our earthly perspective, we either err to the side of pride or despair. Pride would have us saying, yep, I'm, I'm good on all of those things. I'm already compassionate. I'm already kind. I'm already humble. <laughs> this is not helpful to us because no matter how good we may be, we can never measure up to the good uh, and perfect standard of God. Now, despair, on the other hand, would have us say, man, According to this, I fall way short. God's standard is just too high for me. Why bother even trying? But the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that Christ goes right in between and cuts right between those two responses and says, yes, I know that you cannot in your flesh measure up to the holiness of God. But what God has done in Christ on the cross and what the Holy Spirit is currently doing within you that is convicting us of sin and righteousness and the judgment to come and confirming to us our status as sons and daughters of God is that that is enough. That work that Christ has done and the work that the Spirit is continuing to do is enough to woo us and draw us gently to the God who has called us according to his purposes. And for that, we can rejoice and have much joy. And Paul gives us a vision of this beautiful hope in the beginning of Colossians 3, which is where I'd like to end. He says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Church, is this not good news? This short remark by Paul is the glorious hope of future glorification at the second coming of Christ. When he appears again to the whole world, the kingdom that he inaugurated 2,000 years ago will be fully completed, consummated, resulting in the restoration of our very being. He calls it a new heaven, a new earth, and a bodily resurrection that will see to the obliteration of the effects of the remnants of sin. No more tears, no more sin, and no more pain. And we will see God face to face and know him more deeply than we have ever known him and be more satisfied in him, glorifying him by enjoying his splendor forever. And so let us look to this future together, even as we recognize our current and immediate struggles with sin, knowing that he who has started a good work in you will carry it through to completion. And so may you be encouraged this week and spurred on to love and good deeds with a fervor and a desire in your heart and in your mind to know him, to obey him, and to be drawn to the one who made you, knows you, and loves you. God bless.